Back in 2012, the NHL was a completely different place. There was a new wave of NHL talent coming like Mark Scheifele, Vladimir Tarasenko, and Mika Zibanejad. And while those players turned out to be massive hits, not everyone did, and some of the top prospects in 2012 absolutely failed. So today, we're going to be taking a look at the NHL's top 50 prospects all the way back in 2012 to see which ones hit, which ones didn't, and which ones became absolute fails. So make sure you watch till the end as we go through every single player here and hit that subscribe button if you're new for more hockey content just like this all throughout the year. Now going through the top 50 prospects, we're going to be ranking them through five different categories, all the way at the top of Hall of Fame, then Star, then Good, Meh, and then last but not least, the Fail Tier. Being selected all the way up at 12th overall by the Islanders in the 2009 NHL Draft, Calvin DeHaan had some pretty lofty expectations. Looked at as more of an offensive defenseman in his draft year, getting 63 points in 68 games in the OHL of Oshawa, he would develop pretty solidly, but would kind of stagnate at the pro level. He would really prioritize the defensive game though, and that would be his bread and butter at the NHL level. Unfortunately for him, he would only play really one full season, playing 82 games in 2017 for the Islanders, but really being more of a depth defenseman who could log some good minutes and put up some good defensive play, but not much else. Now in 2024, playing a death role of the Tampa Bay Lightning, which is not unlike his career up to this point, I'm gonna give it a straight meh. Mark Stone was an absolute slow burner, a sixth round pick all the way in 2010. He was somebody that was doubted all of the way, but continued to get better and better, absolutely dominating his last year with the Brandon Wheat Kings, getting 123 points in 66 games. Really, the big thing that's held Mark Stone back has been the constant injuries throughout his career, which I think held him back from maybe the Hall of Fame tier. But as of right now, we're going to put him right in the star tier. Starting us off in the first fail of the list, and we go on to Ty Ratty, who is looking to be a really interesting player. A 32nd overall pick by the Blues back in 2011. He was an absolute dynamite producer with Portland, getting 121 points in 69 games in 2012, 33 points in 21 playoff games, and just every playoff run he would have with Portland was magical. And even though he would have a couple of really brilliant preseasons here and there, his best season would be 11 points in 50 games in his last NHL year with Edmonton and would be right to the KHL afterwards. Currently a great producer of Lincoln being HC in the SHL, but not much more than that. A great European player, but was never able to translate well. A straight fail. Now the next player on this list was pretty friggin' good and I can't wait to get into him, but first let's talk about today's sponsor in Sleeper Fantasy. As we announced in the last video as well, Sleeper is available in Canada everywhere except for Ontario. So if you wanna win big with your hockey knowledge, Sleeper Fantasy is the best way to do it. All you gotta do is pick more or less on different players. And today we're gonna go through three picks on the last day of regular season hockey. And today I got Pavel Buchnevich more than 0 0.5 per, uh, points versus Dallas. He's been installed as of late, but I feel like just the stars won't have much to play for today. But we'll see what happens. And then you also have Ilya Sorokin, less than 2.5 goals against. I think he's going to want to get that starter job in the playoffs. And with the Penguins out, there's not much of an incentive for them to try in this game. And then I also got Victor Hedman, more than 2.5 shots on goal. He's just been racking up those shots lately, so we're going to ride on him. $10 down to win at 63 by the end of the night. But if you guys want to join me on Sleeper, go in the description, click on the link, and when you use promo code GRAV, you'll get up to a $500 match. If you put in $20, you'll get 20 free bucks of Sleeper. A heck of a deal there, and thank you to Sleeper for sponsoring today's video. In 698 games with the Preds, he has 605 NHL points this year as well, setting the new record for goals in a season by any Predator and getting 94 points in 82 games. He has been a beast through and through and deserves the star mark. As another great Tampa Bay Lightning draft pick, Nemestikov has turned out pretty solid throughout his career. It was looking like he would be an absolute dynamic player after a 44-point season in 62 games with Tampa in 2018, but since then, he's kind of filled more of a middle six responsible defensive role, and that's what he's become so far with the Winnipeg Jets. But with less than 300 points in more than 700 career games at the NHL level, it's hard to qualify Nemestikov as anything other than good. A solid player in his time, but definitely not the most memorable.
Going to the first goaltender of the list, Matt Hackett was a really interesting case. He was a third rounder back in 2009, and in that season with the Plymouth Whalers in the OHL, he had a 930 save percentage in the playoffs, was a pretty great starter for them, and he got better and better. In 2012 in Minnesota, as a 21-year-old, he got a 922 save percentage in 12 games, and the future was looking bright. But unfortunately, after that great stint with the Minnesota Wild, he would only play 14 NHL games afterwards and not really impress in any of them. And the last time he played in any league was back in 2020 in Norway, where he didn't put up the greatest numbers either. A player that had so much potential it was looking like for Minnesota, but just sputtered out out of nowhere. And unfortunately, Hackett finds himself in the failed tier. Simon Dupre is a very interesting case. A 30th overall pick by the Penguins back in 2009. He was looked at as a big defenseman who had some good first pass tools, but was a little bit raw. But I really don't think we ever saw Dupre come into the NHL level and, and unlock talent that just wasn't there. He was an okay producer for the Penguins at different points, but was never really able to have full seasons, and especially past 2015, had some major concussion issues that kept him out of the lineup. But since then, we've seen him carve out a pretty solid career overseas, playing well in the DAL, the SHL, and most recently in England in the EIHL. Even though the injuries were definitely unfortunate, it's hard to call Dupre anything other than a fail. Jack Campbell is one of the most fascinating players on this list. If we made this video seven years ago, he would be easily in the fail category. An 11th overall pick by the Stars in 2010, had a magical season in the NTDP, especially in the World Juniors, was brilliant wherever he went, but since then wasn't really able to do much at the pro level, especially at the NHL level, but would go to the Toronto Maple Leaf system, the LA Kings system, and would look pretty solid there. Ultimately signing a huge contract with the Edmonton Oilers, though that has not worked out so far. Considering where he was able to come from the bust category, Campbell has had an okay career and has definitely gotten a lot of money for himself, and I'm going to put him in the mad tier. In a lot of ways, Tyler Toffoli has been an incredible success story, being a 47th overall pick by the Kings in 2010, mostly dropping due to a lack of real size and a lack of great speed, especially with his skating. That kind of dampered some scouts on him, but he was an incredible player afterwards with the Ottawa 67s, would win the Stanley Cup with the LA Kings, be a pretty big part of that team, and become a great offensive producer, a great goal scorer, which is what he was drafted to be. Not somebody that I think ever touched the star tier, but has been such an under-the-radar power play option and such an under the radar offensive guy that it's hard to not love him going straight in the good tier Kyle Paul Murray is probably one of the more under the radar players on this list somebody that's just carved out a great career for himself as a 26 overall pick somebody who was looked at as a great speedy shooter shooter that could be a fantastic sniper in the future Paul Murray just had a really lengthy and great NHL career somebody that hasn't been ever at that elite category but always a great top six piece and this year of the Islanders has had a fantastic season 53 points so far and has been one of their most valuable players especially at age 33 that's pretty impressive going straight in the good tier. Carter Ashton is actually the first player on this list that I really had no idea about coming in, but it's not really too much of a surprise. He was a 29th overall pick by Tampa, was pretty quickly traded to Toronto as well. But looked at as a power forward that brought some decent speed, Ashton was just never really an offensive producer. He was drafted when he got 50 points in 70 games in the WHL, and even though there were times where he showed some promise, at the NHL level, he just really wouldn't do anything, and he wouldn't even score an NHL goal in over 50 games. Like some other players on this list, he's carved out a decent overseas career for himself, right now playing in the SHL and carving out a decent role for himself, but in the NHL, was a complete fail. Maybe one of the most unfortunate ones on this list, where Carter Raquel was looking like an absolute stud early on with the Anaheim Ducks, a player that could be an absolute star in this league, getting 69 points in 77 games back in 2018. But since then, we've seen Raquel's finishing and confidence slowly diminish, and now he's become an okay producer with the Pittsburgh Penguins, somebody that definitely is overpaid and you want to see more from. But considering the talent that he was showing in his mid-20s just a few years ago, he could have been so much better, but unfortunately, just goes in the good tier. 
Johan Larson was a pretty interesting case. He was always looked at as more of a two-way defensive player, and that was what he was at the NHL level. You can see the role that he was able to provide with the Wild, with the Sabres. He was always in that bottom six, and he only got 10-plus goals one season, and that was back in 2016. He was fine in his defensive role, but nothing much more than that, and I'm going to give him a straight back. Ryan Murray is one of the highest drafted players on this list. As a second overall pick by Columbus in 2012, he's somebody that always played a safe, well-rounded game, but was never able to push much past that at the NHL level, being an okay depth D and being that for the Edmonton Oilers this year. But even though he has a Stanley Cup, hasn't really been able to do much else with his career, and I'm going to give him a fail. He's been okay when he's been playing, but he just hasn't been able to carve out an NHL role for himself. And at second overall, he just can't have that year having his best season 75 points in 81 games all the way in 2024 at 34 years old Nyquist is just a beast and a solid entry into the good tier Nathan Bellevue is a very interesting case as a 17th overall pick by Montreal in 2011. He was always a player that I never really was sure of the actual true talent level, but he's a guy that was physical, brought some good skating ability, and it was easy to see why he was drafted so high. But since then, he wasn't really able to carve out full NHL seasons or at least be a consistent player. His best year would come in 2017 in his last year of Montreal, 28 points in 74 games, but afterwards really wasn't able to play much because of a lot of injuries and just inconsistencies, and now finds himself in the Swiss National League playing decent minutes with Clawton but not much more than that he's gonna get a fail here Kelly Aircrock is one of those players that I want to see be better than they are because of the talent, the skill set, and the smarts that they have, but they've just turned into a solid bottom six piece, and that's what they've been over the past few years with Nashville or Toronto. Wherever they go, they are a solid producer, and not really much more than that. I'm going to give them a mad tier, but they're probably one of the better players in the mad tier. Now on to one of the most high-profile busts on this list, and Alex Galchenyuk, a third overall pick by the Montreal Canadiens. The fall from grace has been pretty insane to watch, as one of the highest-skilled prospects in the league. He was somebody that came into the NHL Montreal and was immediately a fantastic producer. He would get 56 points in 82 games, 30 goals back in 2016, looked like a future top six stud. But after that, was just unable to find any consistency, would bounce from team to team, from situation to situation, and now finds himself in the KHL. Obviously, he's a great KHL player, but just not an NHL guy that could produce consistently. And even though I don't think I'll give him a fail because of his great years in Montreal, he's not going to get much better. Going straight in the Met tier. A little bit higher than I would have expected on this list, Cody Eakin has actually carved out a pretty solid career for himself. As a Winnipeg kid, a third round pick, an 85th overall pick by the Capitals, he was a pretty solid player in his prime. A 40-point campaign for the Stars back in 2015, and since then, even though there were some inconsistencies and he found himself in the National League last year, this is a player that was pretty solid in his prime and provided some good value. Though hasn't played a game yet this year, we'll see where he goes next, but I'm going to put him in the med tier, but a pretty strong one at that. One of the most high-profile busts on this list, David Rumblad was looking like an exceptional player with the St. Louis Blues until he wasn't. He was a player that had some great seasons in Sweden, but once he carried over the North American game, he pretty much just fell flat. He had some great puck-moving ability and an offensive game, showed some good moments in the AHL, but he never really had much of a consistent career at the NHL level and would quickly go back to the European leagues and now is a captain in the SHL with Moto Hockey. If you couldn't tell already, yeah, he's a fail. Zach Cashian, we all know him and love him. He has turned into a great bottom sixer throughout his NHL career and put up some pretty good numbers too at different seasons. Back in 2014 for Vancouver, had 29 points in 73 games, but it wasn't really much more than that at the NHL level. A consistent guy who was able to bring what he did with the physical style, but was a bottom sixer through and through. Right in the mat tier for him, but to be able to carve out that type of career, that's not nothing. But as a 13th overall pick, still pretty surprising you with that hop.
Now we really haven't gotten a fantastic player in a long time in this list, but next up, JT Miller, he comes to save us. As a 15th overall pick by the Rangers in 2011, Miller was just a really solid middle six player for a while and was in the good tier for quite a bit in his career until Vancouver came and he became an absolute stud. You can see the point totals he's been able to put up, the numbers he's been able to put up, 102 points so far this season. JT Miller has just been an absolute beast offensively and has become one of the better producers in the league in every situation. Gotta put him in the starts here. Clefbaum is absolutely one of the most unfortunate cases on this list. Somebody that had an incredible career ahead of him. He had a 38 points, 12 goal campaign in 2017 as the Oilers were rising, but since then had massive injury troubles and would have shoulder injuries that would set him back completely, likely never playing an NHL game again. I'm still going to put him in the mad tier because those seasons he had were fantastic, but unfortunately, injuries kept him from his potential. Jane Schwartz has carved out an incredible career for himself as a 14th overall pick by St. Louis, a great dual threat offensive piece that has just been solid and consistent throughout the years and being a big part of St. Louis's cup run back in 2019 and becoming a Stanley Cup champion, of course, and since then has been a solid producer for the Seattle Kraken, though winding down his career production-wise. Definitely, though, in the good tier. Going on to a big one that missed the mark, though, in Joe Colborn, who had some massive potential as a big man center. And it's pretty fascinating to see how his whole career went because he had so much potential going out of the University of Denver, some incredible point totals there. But once you hit the Leafs level, once he was actually there with Toronto, it just didn't really seem like he was able to fully adapt. And at the NHL level, wasn't able to match the speed, the pace of the game, and was quickly swept away. Playing his last pro hockey at all back in 20. 2018 in the AHL. Colborne unfortunately goes smack dab in the fail tier. Ryan Murphy is an unfortunate case because I think he was a little bit ahead of his time with the great skating and on-ice vision he had. He was just a player that back then wasn't very easy for a lot of coaches to trust. And the most games he would play at the NHL level was actually in 2014, his rookie year with Carolina, playing 48 games and getting 12 points. But unfortunately, with some of the defensive issues and the inconsistencies there, it was hard to really give ice time to Murphy back then. And so far, he's had a pretty good career back in Europe and playing in the Ice HL in Austria and playing pretty well well there but unfortunately straight in the fail tier for Murphy. Joe Moore like a lot of defensemen on this list that hasn't worked out he was an okay solid two-way D but really didn't have the superior talent to succeed at the NHL level and really wasn't a full-time player whatsoever throughout his time with the Bruins, the Canadians, the Jets, or anything like that, and has been bouncing over a bunch of overseas leagues recently and playing in the EIHL in 2014, being a pretty solid player over there in England. But going to give him a fail. Brandon Saad was absolutely one of the most underrated players of that generation, being a great middle sixer for a super long time and still is, winning two Stanley Cups with the Chicago Blackhawks and getting multiple 50-plus point seasons. Afterwards, he would settle in more of a defensive role, and although that was good, he became more of this solid middle six piece. Nothing absolutely special, but he brought some great seasons to the game and is still going, getting 42 points in his last 81 games this season with St. Louis. I think he is the definition of the good tier, a solid producer that's been a great player all throughout his career. Nick Bukestad is a fascinating player, somebody that was a Minnesota hockey legend and throughout the NCAA of Minnesota was a brilliant player. As a 19th overall pick by Florida, it would take him a while to realize that full potential, but he would have a great season in 2018, getting 49 points in 82 games, but afterwards wasn't able to get past the 20 point mark until 2023. But this year, he's been back at a fantastic level of AZ. In 76 games, it's 22 goals, 45 points and has been back at a pretty solid level and hopefully that's able to continue in Utah. But Bukestad, Bukestad, even though there has been a lot of patience needed, he's put up some pretty solid seasons and hopefully can continue that. I'm going to just put him in the good tier, but just barely. 
Dustin Schultz was looked at as one of the better prospects of his time for a very good reason. With the offensive mind he had, the skating ability, there wasn't really many holes in his game. Being fantastic for the University of Wisconsin, he would develop well going with the Oilers and then being dealt to the Pittsburgh Penguins, where he'd win two Stanley Cups for them and be a great offensive D in his prime. I don't think that prime really lasted as long as it probably should have, but he's still been a solid player for the Capitals since then and the Kraken as well. And I'm going to give him the good tier for the Cups he's won and how important they were to those Cups and especially that 2017 Cup. You got to give credit where it's due. Yolormia had some massive potential. He was a 16th overall pick by Buffalo, was compared to Thomas Vanek, was a player that really was an interesting player of the future with his frame, with the shooting ability. And even though I don't think he was able to fully realize that after some dominant Liga seasons, he's still become a pretty decent middle six piece. And this year with Montreal, 24 points in 65 games, 17 goals. He's been as advertised in different ways, almost as one-dimensional uh, in ways as Thomas Vanek, but still has brought some good value to the game. Nothing crazy or anything, but he's had some solid seasons, and I'm going to put him straight in the Mets here. Robin Lennerman was somebody that had a meteoric rise, and even though he was a player that had some inconsistencies, I just absolutely love the person that he was, the awareness he brought to mental health throughout his time in the NHL, and he had some pretty good seasons too. Even in more death rolls, he was good, but his best season would come with the New York Islanders in 2019, getting a 930 save percentage in 46 games. He was a great starter in his prime, had some brilliant seasons, and was one of the best NHL goalies back then. And even though he hasn't really played as much recently because of injuries and everything like that, his prime was still pretty friggin' good, and you gotta give him some respect there. Going straight in the good tier. Jonas Brodin has been one of the most under-the-radar, competent defensive D for a very long time. And even though I don't think the offense totals are there to put him in the star category, he's been a solid and just under-the-radar guy for Minnesota. And that's how he has always been, just consistently doing his job well. And at the NHL level, no matter where you get a player like that, it is extremely valuable. At 10th overall, you'll take it, and Minnesota definitely has. Putting him right in the good tier, not quite star level, but that consistency has been really appreciated. It's definitely sad to see how Tim Erickson's career went in North America and the NHL because there was real talent there. As a 23rd overall pick by the Flames back in 2009, he would have some great seasons in Sweden and would ultimately carry over to the NHL, but not really be able to stick completely. That was the big thing. Even though there were some good moments, some good plays here and there, he wasn't able to show that complete game or push that offensive level to where it needed to be for him to get a full-time spot. And now playing in the SHL where he probably should be, He's been a solid D over there and hopefully will continue to be, but going straight in the fail tier. It's pretty hard to think about, but Brendan Smith back then actually had some incredible offensive promise. He was a guy that had some good moments and in the AHL was actually looking pretty good at Grand Rapids, but unfortunately, he would kind of just fill into this defensive depth role to stick at the NHL level. And obviously some guys need to go into the NHL and find a role for themselves. Well, for Smith, it was in the physical aspect of the game, and that's what he's been able to do with Detroit, with the Rangers, with the Canes, and now with the New Jersey Devils. Not pushing as much as he should, but still being okay. But as you can tell with Bleacher Report saying that he could fill the void of Nicholas Lidstrom in a few years, the talent was there, the potential was there, but just wasn't able to fill it. But still, because he's been an NHLD, I'm going to put him in the Met tier. Charlie Coyle has just been an absolute beast to watch develop over these past few years. Actually, as a first round pick with San Jose, he wouldn't play any games with them, but would go into the Minnesota Wild system and carve out some pretty good middle six years for them, but would ultimately be gone to the Boston Bruins, and since then has just gotten better and better in that system. And this year, 60 points in 81 games, having a truly big breakout career year for himself. And that's been awesome to watch. This is a guy that has just been a really under the radar player, but he's gotten better and better as he's gotten older, which is pretty awesome to see right in the good tier. I was on the Sven Berchi train. You were on the Sven Berchi train. We all wanted to see Sven Berchi work, but unfortunately it was just never able to happen. He had some good skill and some electrifying moments, but that complete game at the NHL level was really just never able to truly stick. He had some good moments here and there, and in limited sample sizes had some decent NHL statistics, but wasn't able to really carve out a role for himself and would go European uh, in overseas and this year playing in the Swiss league and playing pretty well for himself. 
I hope Berchi just has all of the success in the world because the injuries as well that he had to sustain weren't all too pretty either. I'm going to put him in the failed tier, but with Berchi, he was a player that had to deal with a lot and just wasn't the right player at the right time, unfortunately. Chris Kreider has somehow continued to age gracefully, just like Charlie Coyle has put up some absolutely mammoth numbers recently after being a solid middle six piece for a long time. Kreider was a great young player for the Rangers, but it just gotten better and better. And you can see the goal scoring statistics, 52 goals back in 2022 and 36 goals, 39 goals since then in the two seasons then. And Kreider has just been an excellent offensive piece, a absolute dynamic power play guy, and just somebody that get banging goals whenever you need it, bring in some great leadership. Kreider has been the man. It might be controversial, but I'm going to put him in the star category. He has been absolutely electric as of recent. And I think over the last few years, the numbers should put him in that tier. What he was able to do in the OHL afterwards was insane. And a 100-point campaign as a D with Windsor in 2011 really set him up for success in the future. And he would be a solid two-way offensive D for the Preds but not really able to push to that elite, unreal level. And unfortunately, after being traded to Philly, had some major injury issues and hasn't played since. I'm going to put him in the good tier because that's what he's been, but unfortunately, he might not play another NHL game. Jacob Marshall was a huge prospect and still is a huge player to this day at six foot six as a Swedish goalie. And it's pretty funny to see just the progression in his game because he was a player that kind of had some struggles adapting to the NHL level with the Florida Panthers. But once he was traded to Vancouver and got in that system, he started to turn a page in the mid 2010s and would continue to get better and better, ultimately landing with the Calgary Flames in a big free agency deal and having some of his best seasons since then. That 2022 campaign, getting a 922 save percentage is his best among any season so far and Markstrom's turned himself into a solid great goaltender at times going straight in the good tier. Unfortunately for the Arizona Coyotes, Brandon Gormley was an absolute fail in every single way. Was the 10th ranked prospect by Bleacher Report after the 2012 draft, but really wasn't able to materialize with Arizona, or really anybody for that matter. Was just a player that wasn't able to bring that offensive game to the NHL level completely, and that puck moving ability just wasn't able to translate. And he's been in a multitude of European leagues since then, most recently being in the DEL in Germany. But let's be honest, Gormley is definitely one of the biggest fails on this list. And number nine is Ryan Strom, who was a pretty touted prospect back in his day as a fifth overall pick by the New York Islanders. He was a great player in the OHL, but I don't think really was able to realize his potential completely, especially after his first couple years of the Islanders. I mean, he got 50 points in his second NHL season in 81 games, but since then hasn't been as incredible. Had a couple of outlier years with the New York Rangers playing with Artemi Panarin, but it's just been a solid middle six piece. Nothing special, but right in the good tier. Tarasenko is somebody I want to put in the Hall of Fame tier, but there has just been kind of a disconnect between his best seasons and now. Still, he's been a great top sixer for the Senators and the Panthers this year. But you can see what he's been able to do in his prime with the St. Louis. Some absolutely unreal seasons, especially in the mid-2010s. He was an electric player, one of the best offensive players in the entire league. I hope that Tarasenko could have the hardware in the future to be a Hall of Famer. He already has that Stanley Cup. Maybe some more international awards might get them there, but Tarasenko was an absolute absolute butte in his day and I'm gonna put him in the star tier but definitely one of the better ones in the star tier Then going on to Mark Shifley, who has been an absolutely incredible offensive player, really throughout his entire career with the Winnipeg Jets and recently getting 70 points in 73 games. It's what Mark Shifley does best. He's another player like Tarasenko, who I don't think is quite on that Hall of Fame tier, but maybe if he gets that Stanley Cup, he could end up getting there. But as of right now, going right smack dab in the star tier.
Nika Zibinijad, one of the favorite players on this list for me, has been an absolute rock star since he's entered the league. Still absolutely silly that they traded him for, uh, for Derek Broussard. An actual insane trade. And since then, he's made the Sens pay in a lot of ways, being an incredible producer for the Rangers, a power play beast, and one of the best offensive players in the league. He could be in the Hall of Fame tier depending on how you see him, but I'm going to put him in the star tier for right now. First overall pick by the Oilers in 2012, who had some great seasons in the OHL, wasn't able to stick at the NHL level, even though he showed some good moments offensively, some electrifying moments, that ability to stay, that ability to keep those top six spots, earn those spots, Yakupov was lacking, and since then has become a great KHL player, which is probably what he was destined to be. Then we go on to Dougie Hamilton, who unfortunately for everybody that he's played for has been a much better player than Nail Yakupov has been, but Hamilton was just a slam dunk. Somebody that throughout every league he played was an absolute beast offensively with the size he had. It was almost impossible that he wasn't going to become a great NHL player, and he has done that. He has been that, and even though there are times where the point totals weren't as insane as it probably should have been, he was able to get 74 points last year of New Jersey, finally have that incredible breakout year that we have been expecting Hamilton to have for so long a fantastic offensive piece and a star throughout his career Huberto's career will be fascinating to look back on with the two incredible seasons that he's had with Florida the 115 point campaign he had in 2022 being maybe the best playmaker that entire season but since then being more of a great top six guy who has been around the 50 or 60 point range Huberto has been a weird one to track, but the offense has been there. He's proved himself in the past to be an absolute dynamic player and has had those great seasons before. I'm going to put him in the star tier, though maybe there's the case if he gets a little bit better and back to an 80-point range that he could be in the Hall of Fame tier. If there was a Hall of Fairy Good, Mikkel Granlund would be a slam dunk first ballot Hall of Fairy Good famer because he throughout his career has just had some fantastic years, but hasn't been able to show incredible consistency. There was great points with Minnesota, especially a 69 point campaign in 2017, led by a 67 point campaign the year after. But since then, has had some weird seasons, getting back to the 60 point plateau of Nashville, then back down to the 36 point range. And then this year, San Jose, almost 60 points in 68 games games he's been a really inconsistent player but at times has shown some incredible offense and you love to see that but I'm gonna put him still in the good tier but now on to the NHL's top prospect from 2012 Yeah, according to Bleach Report, it was Evgeny Kuznetsov, who back then was hard to really deny as a top-tier prospect. He got 41 points in 49 games as a KHL player and had a great playoffs as well in unbelievable world juniors. Really, the sky was the limit for it. And those first few seasons in Washington were electric. He had a 77-point campaign in 2016, just absolutely lighting the world on fire. He then go into 2018, where he got 83 points, was one of the best players for the Washington Capitals, one of the best players in that entire playoff run for them, was an absolute beast, getting 32 points. And again, the sky was the limit. But afterwards, in 2019, he would continue some solid production. But then after that is when the fall off started to begin, where the production and the offense wasn't really good enough to compensate for the lack of defensive ability, the carelessness in his own zone. And that would lead to some unfortunate inconsistencies in Washington. Because of that lack of longevity and consistency, I don't think I'm going to put him in the star category. But just because of how good those top seasons were, he was a special player, man, and goes in the good tier. But those were the top 50 prospects in 2012 and all of the breakdowns for everybody where they are now. I hope you guys did enjoy. If you did, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell. Share the video of all the hockey fans you guys know online and comment down below. What did you guys think of this top 50? How do you think it's turned out? Which players would you give a uh, fail, a star, a Hall of Fame rating to? I'll let you know all your thoughts down below. And of course, share the video of all the hockey fans you guys know online. And I will see you in the next one. I hope you have a great hockey day. And enjoyed the big video today, and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.